All right, so thank you all for joining for this new Continual AI Meetup uh, titled Continual Learning uh, in the Cloud at the Edge or both. Uh, so in this meetup, uh, we will try to address the question on where continual learning uh, should take place in the cloud at the edge or its relationships with different uh, distributed and federated learning paradigms. And we will start, as always, with a series of spotlight presentations, 15 minutes each, uh, from four continual learning experts. And later, we will have, we will open a debate, let's say, on, on this topic, uh, so that anyone can ask questions to the speakers. And uh, hopefully, we will try to answer some questions that are interesting in this area. Uh, so the speakers for today's meetup uh, will be uh, Roger uh, Kishi uh, from Intel Labs uh, with his talk towards edge enhanced uh, robot uh, 4.0, continual learning and spatial temporal intelligence. Then uh, Bing Liu, uh, professor at the University of Illinois Chicago, we uh, will continue with his presentation, learning on the job, online lifelong and continual learning. Uh, then we will have Fernando Casado from the University of Santiago de Capistela. Uh, with his talk on collaborative and continual learning for classification tasks uh, in a society of devices. And then we will hear from Matthews uh, B. Lange from KU Leuven, uh, unsupervised model personalization while preserving privacy and scalability, an open problem. So thank you uh, speakers uh, for joining us today. And I think uh, that we can start the meetup now with Roger. So Roger, you can present uh, when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, so today is the topic is about the age enhanced robot for four point oh, and we think two important te techniques in uh, continual learning and a spatial temporal intelligence. The continual learning is uh, um, working uh, and at two goals. One is uh, avoiding catastrophic splitting when learning um, more, more, more tasks. And uh, also we need a fast adaptation to the new domains knowledge. So the spatial temporal intelligence here, I mean, we utilize some symbolic AI approach such as the knowledge graph and the dynamic knowledge graph to um, as a memory system and support the continual learning capabilities. So the first is the background of this research. And our vision is that uh, we have do a lot of survey on the market. The millions of multifunctional service robots will happen in the next five to 10 years. So uh, the robot can be the tutor, can, have, can be the assistant, and can also provide some help to the elderly and also provide the service. And we, um, we, we think the technology uh, applicable to the smart home and device and even the uh, service robots, including uh, adaptive person identification. So here we, we, we have some um, adapt, uh, ad adaptive multimodality person identification. So um, the, the robot needs to know who it is and uh, who calls the actions. And uh, the adaptive uh, speech UI is uh, we utilize to um, apply the personalized knowledge graph for the emotion caring. And uh, they should care about the elderly and the family member and connect to the family members. So the third one is the semantic thing understanding. So it needs to learn the indoor object uh, incrementally. So to understand the things and uh, do the uh, recognize objects such as the wall stores and some other objects uh, in the home scenario. So what I mean is the evolution to the robot 4.0, because as we can see for the, uh, it, it, the evolution of the robot capability can start from robot um, one, it's the automation. So the main capability is the controller. Um, and then we jump to the robot 2.0 and it's focused on the collaborative of the robots. 
So it has some human machine collaborations also. And then to the robots 3.0, it's uh, focused on the autonomous. So uh, now we, we have seen a lot of reinforcement learning, human robot interaction, and the natural language processing technology appear in the service robots. And now um, we, we are approaching to the robot 4.0, as we think the robot should be the uh, as a service and the age is quite important. And the two techniques, continual learning and spatial temporal intelligence are the fundamental for achieving this goal. Here is the uh, three uh, key capabilities we need to solve when we apply the robot as a service. The first is uh, um, uh, autonomy. And so this one, we needed to do a lot of sensor fusion since in the robot, we have a lot of sensor uh, that we can use. So it, it has capability to do the localization and mapping and pace planning. And uh, the second is the human robot interaction, HIR. So here we need to understand the human intention and do the task planning. And then the third one is the manipulation of the robot. So when the robot understands the human's intention and knows the things and um, objects, so it needs to do the manipulation uh, in the dynamic sense. So um, the, the key points of the three main um, fields is the 3D thing understanding. So the robot needs to know the um, um, things, everything. So, and then do the navigation, do the imitation learning and the reinforcement learning. So for this research, we need to solve three main and difficulties. The first is the uncertainty. So the models should be updated through interaction with the robot or with the observation when the robot deployed in the environment. And we need to get the confidence measurements and then trigger the active interactions. And of course, it needs learning from streaming data or the small amount of data, such as the few short learning or very short learning. So the second problem is uh, the robot don't know, um, um, don't know. It needs to interact to get more data and learn from the small data. So the third, third is that the current um, is lacks of knowledge. So we have seen a lot of uh, common sense knowledge base, such as ConceptNet, but the knowledge uh, of the robot, uh, and especially for the service robot, it needs a personalized knowledge graph. It means we need to build up the knowledge graph based on the um, um, current things without um, uh, with the help of the interaction with the humans. And some of the, uh, these three main challenges in are here. We have, uh, we, we need to, if we want to apply the technology uh, such as uh, personal identification, the object interaction and the, uh, the object detection, and the emotion recognition, uh, also intention recognition, yeah, and then the event activity. So all these techniques, we, we need a very high accuracies um, if we apply this to the real robots, because uh, any viewpoint change will um, pose real, real, real large challenges for the personal identifications. Uh, and the robots need to aware of these mistakes. But um, now the current, the gap of the research of the academy and the industry is quite large. We cannot guarantee near 100 percentage accuracy of a lot of techniques we are developing. So we are moving to approach uh, to filling these kind of gaps. So uh, here is a general overview of the adaptive human robot interaction framework we did. It's actually, we, we, we did it two years ago, actually. So we up, I will update the new one later. So uh, we, we first do the general continuous learning for the uh, robust multi-view learning, as you can see at the bot button. Um, the multi-view learning is uh, quite um, famous algorithm in the machine learning. So uh, we have the um, uh, self-paced co-training such as this. And then it needs a hybrid novel machine learning techniques such as zero short, few short, and associative learning, and also the reinforcement learning, even the weekly supervised learning algorithms. So uh, for the application wise, it needs a lot of usages in um, computer vision technologies. First is the personal identification. 
and then for the emotion understanding, and then for the object detection and the scene segmentation. And so um, more, more upper layer is the scene understanding. We need to combine the knowledge we detect using the computer vision techniques to achieve the adaptive human understanding. So the prior knowledge is from the two parts. One is the common sense, common sense knowledge graph, as I mentioned, such as the concept eight, it's from the Google. And then is the personalized knowledge graph we built just at the current things um, with the, uh, after interaction with the hu humans in the home or um, the robot observed itself. And it gets the uh, sparse feedbacks from the human. And then uh, this also provided the prior knowledge for the environment understanding. And uh, all the knowledge graph, uh, I mean the spatial temporal intelligence is here. So it will receive the, the knowledge and memorize the concept in the knowledge graph. And then it further supports the reasoning, planning, or even prediction. And then in a loop, we did the act, uh, action and the interactions and uh, get the feedbacks from the humans um, later. Uh, of course, uh, we, we also have a human robot interaction simulators uh, here to provide the sim, sim to real data to achieve this goal. So this is the uh, achievement of uh, current uh, uh, our some, some of the package we already developed and also we released the SDK of this one. So this one is uh, um, we integrate the uh, state-of-the-art face recognition, person re-identification, and also object detection and activity recognition to support the um, person ID, object ID, and even the emotion activities to the thing understanding levels. As you can see, the knowledge graph can be the, the long-term memories. And then it will give a feedbacks to the thing, understand, thing, thing level understandings. Um, uh, for example, we have a lot of policies and roles in the knowledge graph, such as when we uh, do the object recognition, the, we use the SLAM technologies to know uh, where is the objects and the robots can can focus on a certain area of the uh, of the rooms, and then it can collect the more accurate data. It reduces redundant collections using this kind of prior knowledges, and that's from the SLAM technologies. And our goal is to provide new advanced human robot interaction capabilities and accelerated by the Intel architectures and some platforms. And then we need to achieve the adaptive, the adapt, the robust learning from the interaction, and also uh, fuse the multimodality. Because uh, here we we have the sensors from the radar, RFID, and also the video, and also some audios. So these modality signals are fused at the at both feature level and the decision level. So the first um, approach we do the adaptive person identification is uh, we using different modality signals and then we did the con confidence predictors and we find the um, collector, we, we have a collector of the modalities that we receive the high confidence level of uh, samples. And then we using this sample to train the, train the different modalities online. And then um, going deeper, we do the multimodality fusion at the decision level. We using the attribute verifier based on associated uh, association learning, and then we have the outputs of the person ID. Uh, so um, the second part is about the object recognition. This kind of uh, technology has many uh, three three streams. The first is uh, personalized. So the the second is uh, we need to do the model, um, model online adaptation. And uh, the third is the human, human in the loop. The first, the human needs to take the objects to the uh, display and do uh, one sample annotation. And then we have the algorithm to automatically using the temporal coherence to um, annotate, annotate the video um, data. Um, I, I mean, the uh, next sequence of the frames to do the um, annotation. And then we update the model and do the object recognition. The, uh, this architecture is, uh, um, we, we have won the computation in the CVPR database 
uh, challenges in 2018. So this algorithm is uh, published at uh, 2019. So um, it's, it's, it seems quite complex, but, uh, but uh, the high level is that we have two parts. One is uh, do the large um, pre-trained models using the ResNet VGG. Um, and then we have an online data generation to do the data augmentation. We got the proposal ranking and do the proposal selection. And the, the, the second part is uh, instance segmentation, uh, which is a local adaptation with the binary uh, and get the binary segmentations. So um, this is, and finally we do the global adaptation. So the details can be seen in this uh, workshop paper. Uh, this is uh, um, adaptive object recognition uh, results. So we, we test it in the very challenged scenario. Uh, as you can see, some of the medicine, medicine boat is quite small and the keys is quite small. So the views sometimes is uh, really challenging. So we apply the algorithms and then we detect the object segmentation and giving the class label. This, this is the uh, quantitative results. So for simple and uh, complex case, so the accuracies of the real world test-based results are shown here. And the third part is uh, uh, about uh, uh, this package we use uh, we use it to do the emotion recognition so uh, this this figure shows the state of the art of current uh, in, uh, emotion recognitions so from the facial expression so and then to the multimodality and then we with the next step is going to contest and then do the adaptations so we uh, summarize some of the algorithms and data sets development so from the uh, in the last 10 years and uh, we we have found that now it's really more and more challenges you need to learn to learn the emotion states of the humans the challenge case is as you can see the the right corner uh, the bottom of the right corner so the boys when you see the hate so you cannot identify the boys emotion state but uh, in 2019, one paper published using the spatial context learning. So we need to involve the interactions of others with the boys, and we know the things, and then we can use the thing to, to make prediction of the boys' emotion state. So this is going far away from the traditional emotion recognition, just using the naive face modalities. And here is, our modalities, we use the face, the human, the head pose, and the sound, the contest information to do the uh, confu uh, fusions and then to do the emotion recognitions. What about that? So this is a hybrid adaptation framework for the emotion recognition. So we use the video um, and the audio and then do the facial expression, body pose, human gesture at the different views of these uh, different modalities. And then we design the um, API of, the, um, of four different parts. One is a recognizer and another is a data loader and then this uh, trainer for doing the, for uh, tricking the learning algorithms. And here is the core training learning algorithms to core train different views. And then we have the context aware competency estimation to provide a self critic to the recognize, rec uh, recognize uh, results. And then this group can, this framework can be used in also in other um, computer vision um, applications. So for the personalized knowledge graph, so we have the self-growing personalized knowledge graph. And our goal is uh, combine the symbolic rules and the statistical machine learning. And then this um, knowledge graph is self-growing with, with observations and learning from the users. And also it's quite efficient, just to save most of uh, critical information. So combined with uh, knowledge base and uh, efforts from other companies, well, first is uh, Google is a free base, the, also the concept date. So it's purely symbolic based. It cannot be personalized. And for the another one is uh, 
robotics area is a no robot. So they don't have the spot for extensive applications and also they cannot do the self-growing. And also uh, I think it's in the storage they, they are not very efficient. And so at Intel, we have a VDMS systems and uh, that can store the metadata of the videos and then uh, it's quite efficient now and it's a uh, hybrid architectures. So the personalized knowledge graph can be used uh, um, for a, a lot of compelling usages, such as the elderly daily mo monitoring and a smart reminder, uh, for example, to um, remind the elderly um, where is the object. And so um, when, when, when he knows, uh, gives a smart reminder, he should know uh, the objects, right? And then the robot needs to know the position of the objects, right? And then the robots need to do the manu manipulation of the objects. So it need, it's a combination of different technologies to do just uh, one compelling usages. So we're using the knowledge graph uh, as the spatial temporal intelligence to support the robot 4.0. So for example, in the, in, in the um, uh, applications I have mentioned, the knowledge can, can always be and are role based, such as uh, um, some somebody, um, the gender, age, and the body dimension, height, or, or the class, or his some of his uh, habits can be the roles. And also for the objects, the objects attributes such as the shape, color, materials is quite important for doing the recognition purely based on the deep learning algorithms. It's really hard to find the corner case. So the, the also the long tail problems of the object recognition still exist. So for the emotion recognition, we can we can know the emotion uh, when we uh, when we find some action or event um, that usually happen um, before or after an emotion. So that's if, even we cannot see the human's face or the head or, or, or the head pose, um, we can know its emotion just based on some um, knowledge trees, uh, such as the action trees we, we built. So uh, the, finally, we have the human in the loop to uh, always give the sparse feedbacks of the knowledges. So the knowledge graph- Roger, uh, sorry, I, I hate to interrupt. Uh, uh, we are running a bit out of time. If you can get to the conclusions uh, in, in the next minutes, it will be great. Okay, okay, sure. Sorry, sorry for the time, the material is quite low. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, I, I will just go to some of the robot 4.0 reference test bait. So we built this test space combining the cloud edge and the robot. And, and actually I, I didn't um, introduce some edge server designed by our teams. So, so sorry about that, but, uh, but uh, I need to know uh, our conclusion is that we need to uh, using both the robot itself, the edge server and the cloud servers combined and then to share the workloads. So for example, some uh, edge we designed is called Hero X, uh, Hero A and the Hero X. So uh, we need the Hero itself uh, also to as, uh, to, to as the computing platform in the robot. So we, we all build on a lot of uh, um, technologies such as uh, um, I, I have mentioned the adaptive HIR and the knowledge graph and the thing understanding as the ROS node and to do the ROS communications and in you know, the real uh, real applications. And uh, this is architecturally we, we already built up. So for the cloud service, edge servers and uh, hero computing platforms, we have the uh, different uh, um, Movidias and, and like the VPU and FPJ and CPU, GPU kinds of stuff. So, and do, do the, uh, this is the hardware level. And the upper level is uh, we transfer from the ROS uh, on, the lin uh, on the Linux and also in the Windows. And the SDK uh, combined the Intel OpenVINO and some OpenCL, OpenCV SDKs. And then um, the upper is the movement, including the robot SLAM navigation and the mo um, motion planning. And upper is about the perception uh, we are very familiar with. And uh, I have introduced the adaptive HR in the uh, above. So the usage is uh, provided us some smiling reminder and finding objects or daily activities. 
And finally, so we also push the boundary of the um, robot learning research uh, using a lot of computations. One of the computation is uh, held last year is uh, well, we want to build a loop in the human um, and the computer vision technologies and the robots itself um, technologies. Uh, the, oh, the last I will thanks for all the um, ACE teams members uh, that helped me prepare the materials and their contributions in the work. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Roger. So do you plan, Roger, to stay here for the the questions and the debate part at the end, or are you going to sleep now? Because I think that the time zone is not in favor for you. Um, uh, I see. Yeah, I, I, I can stay stay here. Yeah, I can. OK, thank, thank you so much. So I'll keep my questions for later on. Uh, sure, so thank sure. you again for your, uh, for your talk. And I think now we can uh, quickly move to the Bing Liu presentation. Bing, are you here? Yes, I'm here. OK, cool. Uh, so now you should be able to present. I think Roger deactivated his presentation, so you should be able to present using the button okay. present now. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. We can see your screen. Okay, now okay. the slides. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'm going to talk uh, not so long. Um, it's going to be uh, the topic is uh, learning on the job and uh, also interactive self supervision, which is basically based on the uh, sort of blue sky idea I talk about in the Triple AI. And this is the book. Uh, okay. Um, so my motivation of doing this thing called learning on the job is because of my, mainly because of my experience in self-driven cars. I did, I worked on a self-driven car for one year or so, and I was as a consultant that really uh, worked on the car and the physical car and they drove the cars around, so things like that. So the, the problem with self-driven cars is it's really hard to reach the human level of driving uh, with only uh, offline kind of training. Because there are so many corner cases, there are so many, so much complexity uh, in the real world, and uh, it's just so difficult to cover all of them. And the real world is full of unknowns. You know, there are lots of stuff you don't really know, and then when you when you see it, then you, how do you manage? How do you learn that stuff? And also, um, um, when you have um, when you have somebody sitting in the car, and how can you make best use of that person? Uh, that's what I'm talking about, uh, interactive uh, self-supervision. So how can you interact with the person, interact with the environment to gain some information and to learn in the process? Okay. Another thing is uh, on the chatbots. I work a little bit on the chatbots with the students, and uh, I just feel this is also an environment which is um, uh, full of interesting stuff because you have no idea what people is going to say. So we say that's the open environment because it, you don't really know what people are going to say. So everything, the, the guy can say anything new and things like that. You have uh, so how do you deal with that kind of situation? Okay, and again, that's a problem of just impossible to train or impossible to program by engineers and uh, just do that forever. And somehow the the, the chatbot must learn by itself, um, to one way or another. Otherwise, I don't think there's any kind of intelligence. Okay, you, the system has to learn by itself and in order to be autonomous. Um, so that's basically my um, my motivation and, and my sort of experience. And then we talk about the human beings. When we, as a humans, we are very good. Oh, we are very, at least we are very, we are very comfortable in learning in that kind of very complex environment. Although it's not that easy for us, but we can manage without so much problem. Um, the, the, there's a few capabilities we, we have. The first one is we, we really know what is what is the seen, what is the unseen. So um, we, we can spot the normal stuff, normal objects, normal things, and then we can uh, learn them as well and continuously incrementally learn those stuff. And, uh, and at the same time, we are accumulating uh, knowledge we learned in the past. And obviously, we can adapt all those things we have learned in the past. And, uh, to solve our new problems. 
So in the self-driving car, it's, it's really quite very obvious when we see something from the situation, we normally just slow down and we, we sort of manage that how do we navigate to, to, to get re, get out of that situation. Um, but for self for, for self-driving car, this is really a huge problem. So in only in this kind of cases, we do need what is called the learning on the job, which basically means we're learning while we're working. So basically when, when I was driving, when I'm, when the car is driving or when a chatbot is talking, was communicating, was, was, uh, was chatting with people, and can you learn in the process of that, um, that kind of process when a model has been deployed, it's not learning, um, it's, it's not kind of learning sort of a before and then go to the formal training and then you apply a model. So in the past few years, um, I've been doing this lifelong learning and I'm not using the traditional uh, definition uh, so much anymore. So traditional definition is just basically on top. It says you have a sequence of tasks and you learn the task one by one. And then when you face a new task, T n plus one, and if you see at the top, which is the current task, then you can make use of the knowledge from the past to help you learn better. So essentially you have the data, you have the learner and machine learning algorithm, and you have bottom, you have a knowledge base, and then you can feedback to the knowledge base, from the knowledge base to the learner, and uh, to make use of the past knowledge to make you, to make the system learn better. And then you produce the model. So today I'm going to do more talking about the last three lines in, in orange color, the orange color, that is basically learning on the job. So the, let's look at the, the bottom line. So in the learning, in the sort of application process, so that is the, after the model has been built and deployed in the real application. And then we can obviously gain some knowledge and put in the knowledge base. So how do we gain knowledge? The first thing, of course, when we, when we talk to a person, so the chatbot talk to a person, and obviously um, the chatbot can learn something from the person because when whenever we communicate with each other, we obviously learn something from from our, our partner. Another is in the car situation as well. When, you, when the car sort of meets something special, and uh, somehow you should be able to learn something and put in the knowledge base. Another thing is uh, you gain some data, you know, and uh, because uh, you get some feedback from the person, from the people, or from the environment and you get some kind of training data, uh, training data, which is not purposely gained, but uh, it's just in the process, it's naturally, uh, smoothly, you gain those training data, or some example, I'll give you some example later. At the same time, you may find some new task we need to be learned, because you have not learned that task before. For example, you have been, um, for example, you're driving, you know, you can spot pedestrian, pedestrians, then you can spot the chicken and the, the horse, all this kind of stuff, but now suddenly you see a deer on the road and you haven't seen that thing before. Oh, you, you see a plastic plastic bag fly, flying in the, in, the, in the air and uh, then you don't know what to do with that. So essentially in this case, you should learn that uh, incrementally. That's basically the continual learning part, the continual learning part. So this whole thing goes to, works together. It basically allows the system to learn on the job. Essentially while it's working, it can also learn something. It's not just like the current algorithm, you just do a batch training, uh, learning, and then you produce a model, and then you have an application, you don't learn anything. You don't learn anything, just basically apply that model. Whether the model is good or bad, it's, it's just basically that's been said and it cannot be changed. So we want to do something uh, beyond that. So here is a summary, essentially is the continuous learning process, the key characteristics, and the, uh, um, of course, we don't want forgetting as well. And I'm not going to talk about the continual learning because I'm sure everybody knows the continual learning or lifelong learning. And the knowledge accumulation and uh, using and adapting the past knowledge. I want to focus more on this learning on the job, okay, during the model application. And uh, in this case, we need self-supervision. Okay? I'm not talking about this uh, like building language model, this kind of self-supervision, more of uh, supervision by the agent itself, autonomous system itself and in the process of interacting with humans with the environment. So it has to interact. It's like a person, if you sit there forever, they're not gonna learn much. Okay? You have to interact with people with the, with the environment. So in the past, we have uh, 
So the research community has done something called online learning. So online essentially says that some training instances comes, comes in and then how do I update my model? The problem is, of course, the, where the training, training instances come from. So um, it's going to come from self-supervision and interaction. And then, of course, we, have, we are going to do uh, this incremental task. We have to discover new tasks. And how do we discover that new task? And, uh, and how do we learn that new task so that we can um, be smarter uh, next time? So next time when we see the same situation, we don't have to panic. So we don't we know roughly what to do. Okay. So um, in the traditional machine learning uh, makes this a closed world assumption. And uh, we talk about um, things like uh, in training, we, we learn something. And in testing, we expect the same thing. So we can't. Um, so I say we are going to see something different. Um, in terms of supervised learning, you can see the classes um, seen in training must be a superset of what you see um, in testing. So basically means the testing cannot have anything new. Okay? If you have something new, it basically will be classified into one of those non uh, same classes, uh, which is obviously not correct. Uh, so the issue is if the if the system um, cannot um, identify anything changing, anything new, there's no way you can learn by itself. This is the basic capability. You must determine, you, you, you must sort of decide the, the distribution change and also the even the object change. And then um, with that, as the motivation and the curiosity, whatever that is, then you can learn uh, to, to do better. So the open world basically means that uh, the white test and the, the test, the classes that um, you're seeing in testing and the training, they are not empty. So basically, that's something you have never seen it before. And how do you detect those things? We call it L0, okay, or not. Um, so, um, so learning on the job is, is not something... Um, people have never said, never heard about it before because in the social science, uh, this is a quite uh, well-known phenomenon. And from social science research, I really see seventy percent of human knowledge come from on-the-job learning, and the only ten percent is through formal training. For for example, we go to schools, we go to training classes, and about seventy percent is learned on the job. So while you are working, you are keep learning. And this, of course, normally uh, when social science talk about this 70%, they don't really talk about uh, those common sense knowledge because we learn those common sense knowledge, a uh, lot of them. And you know, when, the, when social, social science um, consider knowledge, they don't consider those common sense knowledge as knowledge because, I mean, everybody knows about it. So it's not something terribly difficult. And then there's also 20% come from the observations. So example, in the self driving car, and when you see something, for example, you see a plastic flying in the air, and then you have to decide what to do. And uh, so, for, of course, you can stop, but uh, sometimes it's very dangerous to stop. And then you can also see, for example, the cars in front of you just drive through, and there's no issue. And then, obviously, you can do the same thing as well. That's basically the uh, imitation, imitation. And so we want that the autonomous system or the AI agent to do the same kind of, uh, thing, basically have the same, same kind of capability. And uh, I think this is necessary in the future. It's not just something good to have, but it's necessary. The, the reason is very simple. The world is just terribly complex and uh, it's constantly changing. You can't, really, you can't be training your algorithms offline forever. Okay? So somehow this autonomous system must have some capability um, you know, to face the real world of open world. I'm not talking about the closed world. I mean, that's basically everything's fixed. Then, then you possibly can train everything um, to make your system to, to cover all this kind of situations. But in the open world, uh, the, this is not possible. Okay. So what are the, what are the steps, in, at least in the learning on the job, this kind of paradigm? And the first thing, obviously, you have to detect um, instance. Uh, instances detect some new inst normal instances. Something is happening, and uh, you are not familiar with that. And then, of course, at the same time, you can formulate some kind of task to learn. Because when you see something new, obviously you have to learn that stuff. Okay, you form some task and to learn that stuff. 
And then at the same time, you need to have training cases. Okay, you have to have training cases. So how do you get the training cases? Um, I'm saying you have to go through this um, interactive self-supervision. I'll have the next slide talking about this. And after that, we have to continue learning. You basically incrementally learn tasks and uh, you know to cover the new things so that, so that in the in the future uh, you will have no problem to recognize this particular object. So um, what I mean by interactive self-sufficient, I've talked about this already. And essentially, you can interact with humans. For example, in self-driving cars, and uh, you can talk to passengers and uh, you can talk to uh, instructors. So this is also my my experience. Okay, my experience and the one we um, during the driving, um, we take the car for the road test. And there are so many kind of situations I can just tell the car what to do. So without just go back to do the training and manual, to go to the debugging and the training, all this nonsense it takes so much time. And I'll, I'll give you an example slightly later. And the, the chatbot is the same thing. You can, when you're when you're chatting with somebody, obviously you will have you have problems. Sometimes you don't understand the guy what the guy is talking about. Sometimes you don't really when the guy talk asking you something, you don't know the answer. But in that this kind of case, you can learn something um, from the guy or from the um, from the another some other sources environment as well, and then you can get environmental um, feedbacks. Feedback, for example, you crash something or whatever. So you have to have an internal evaluation system. The human being, obviously, we have uh, perceptions, we have feelings, we have emotions, those kind of things, which actually give us the rewards, give us the uh, supervisory information. For example, in the self-driving car, self-driving, when we drive as a human being, we when we when we turn, um, the angle is too large and then we are uh, too sharp an angle, then we all feel, you know, the car is flying, something is floating. So you, you have that sort of unsafe feeling that is telling you, you know, that doesn't, doesn't look very safe, okay? So we, we human being has a lot of interesting sort of uh, senses of the sense to tell us that certain sense is not good for us, it's, ris it's risky, okay? So, and the self driving obviously, we should try to get that. So this, is, this whole thing is self-supervision, is basically trying to gather knowledge to get a supervisory or reward information. So to self-supervise ourselves to, uh, in order to learn and to keep us going forward and without being sort of disrupt, disrupted or break down or some breakdown. So here is a simple example, it's a greeting bot in the hotel. And uh, so example, you're in a hotel and uh, the hotel sort of lobby has a uh, robot, which is a greeting every guest. For example, he sees the first guest. This is just an example. See the existing guest. So you can say sort of, say sort of hello, John, and uh, how are you today? So basically means uh, the, the, the bot already knows this person, John, and uh, then he can greet, he greet this person just like, you know, like a friend. And uh, what happens when you see a new guest? The bot must recognize the guest is new, and then I can say, hey, "Welcome to our hotel." Okay, what's your name, sir? And the guest may say, "I'm Jim." And then the bot, of course, start to learn to learn this person, Jim, automatically. So what they do? What does it do? I mean, it's very simple. It just take some pictures, and then you incrementally learn to recognize Jim. And so next time when Jim comes back, and then the bot could say, "Oh, hello, Jim. How are you today?" So we basically learn the same. And uh, this is incrementally, um, sort of, this is also kind of uh, uh, quite obviously learning on the job. It's not being trained. Okay? It's not being trained. It's the trained self. I can train self. I recognize the, the situation, get the new task, and the learn train itself. Okay, train self. Um, so, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the, I'm not going to talk about the results. I think the time is. Uh, for the time's sake. Um, so obviously you can, you know, there's different kind of algorithms for you to detect, um, different kind of uh, detect what are the, what is new, okay? Something is new and then there'll be algorithm to detect that. And then how do you communicate those? Uh, this is another uh, algorithm which is detecting new and then let's forget about it. I just find out the last two slides. So um, in one, I just give you some, uh, one interesting example. And why do we talk about this natural language interface for continual learning? So when we're testing a self-driving car on the road, and uh, at the one um, place, this car basically stopped. They refused to move. 
and then we look around and we don't really know what's what is the what is the thing which makes the car stop the the road is very clear there's no there's no behind nobody in front you know there's nobody on the left nobody on the right it's basically an empty road why the car stop so, so when we go back and we debug we find a little stone small pebble on the road so so this made me think okay why can't the car tell me this the problem in natural language so obviously when you detect the stone um uh, i think the ultrasound sensor detected i mean obviously you can system can tell me you know what's the problem right and also i can tell the car just to go ahead right there's no no, no point to stop here this is there's not it's not going to cause any trouble um, because that stone is so small we didn't we look around we didn't really notice that there's a stone in front okay, in front but it does indeed has a little stone uh, in the, uh, on the road so you can see go through this if if there's a natural language system uh, which we can use as interface between that car and the person and then there are lots of things can be learned automatically yeah i can give the instruction the, the guys can take this as a supervisory information or as rewarding information and then so next time when you see this kind of stone just forget about it that's just fine there's no problem okay and so I don't have to go back and debug and the, the retrain the algorithm. All this, all this nonsense takes so much time. It okay, takes so much time. And uh, then we did some work. This is basically my motivation. I did some work on the natural language, but it's very tough. It's very tough. How do you, how do you abuse this, this kind of uh, natural language interface and also make this interface to learn by itself as well? Uh, it's um, it's uh, quite challenging, but it's quite quite interesting. So I just want to summarize. So the AI system, as we um, talk about autonomous system, especially those systems working in the open world, uh, for example, self-driven cars and uh, mobile robots, and also uh, this uh, uh, chatbots kind of uh, kind of situation. And uh, you have uh, the environment which is full of unknowns. So you have to be able to um, survive in that kind of environment. You need to detect it. You need to learn it. And uh, you need to gather your own training data as well. And you cannot just you know, wait for some for your engineers to, to, to do something, and which is not good. Okay, which is not good. So in order to achieve autonomy, and uh, we do need uh, all those things that also accumulate uh, knowledge and without forgetting all those things we, we need to have. And so obviously we we need this uh, machine learning algorithm with more capabilities uh, than what we have before, what we have now. And uh, I think that's about it. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bing, for your very interesting uh, vision and perspective on, on online, on the job, continual learning. Uh, I think um, I will ask you a question if you want to stay uh, on and uh, after the two spotlight presentations from Matt. And, uh, can you can you ask me now because it's getting late here? Ah, okay, uh, okay, of of, of course. So um, sure. anybody can ask a question, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so you talk about uh, let's say continual learning, lifelong learning on the job. Uh, but have you uh, do you have some insights or uh, thoughts about you know how to evaluate these systems when they're trained on the job and uh, if it is safe enough to let them be trained on the job uh, without you know keeping somehow an eye on how they are, you know, uh, changing their the ways of interacting with the world, maybe introducing some, introducing some biases and, and so on and so forth. Because nowadays, even though we train continually uh, AI systems, we can always check before deployment uh, if everything is in order or at least reasonably in order. Uh, mm. That's suite that can cover all the major aspects we are more concerned about in our application, right? Um, yeah, I mean that's a that's a good question, obviously. And uh, so <clears throat> um, now, the, for example, in the in a self-driving car, self-driving car is very dangerous if you learn on the job and if you are not good enough. Okay, you, you it's obviously very dangerous. And uh, for the for the chatbot kind of situation, that should not be a major problem because you can just when you ask people, uh, you want to make sure everything is okay. And if you ask, if you talk to one person. Uh, you may not trust that person, but you can talk to many people. 
So when you or you something you don't understand, you ask the guy, and the guy may tell you something wrong. Yeah, that's some believe he may trick you. So then you basically don't save that piece of knowledge. What do you do? You probably can ask a number of other people. So we're talking about the environment, which is not just one person. You're talking about the many users. So you can verify things before you sort of save the knowledge. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And whether it's something bias, all these things, you have to um, basically go through different kind of verification process. And uh, you, many things you can't decide yourself. But humans are biased anyway, also. Okay. And, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. We have to deal with that problem, definitely. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting perspective saying that uh, we don't need to update uh, very fast the knowledge. We can just wait to get a bit more feedback. And then when we are sure that the knowledge is, is, is true, yeah. uh, yeah. we can update the that's very interesting. Thanks. So that's any. Anyone else? Uh, Anyone else? Any other questions? All right, so I will ask Ding if he can uh, somehow upload these slides and then uh, send the link to his slides uh, so that we can hey. uh, somehow uh, have a reference to it. Uh, Roger, do you want to say hey. something? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I got lost to you. So, um, Professor Liu, yeah, I'm Roger. So, I have a question. Is, uh, sure. Can you um, give me some insights that um, compared with self supervised learning techn technologies, I, I have seen your presentation, you, you using a lot of interaction with the human to get the feedbacks. What do you right. think is the trend or uh, using just the self supervised or uh, get the f interaction with the human to do the feedbacks. Well, what, which one is the next step? Um, I mean, I, I, technology-wise, I'm not exactly sure which one will work in practice. In the, that will be next. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm what I'm trying to say, this is unnecessary in the future. You now, if you want to have autonomous system, not just robot in a in a kind of a closed environment, right? Let's say you have yeah. you know, the robot. They are only doing certain things. But if you have one of the robots and the mobile robots and the self-driving car is one of those are critical ones. But uh, you can also have mobile robots. You can also have, for example, just now you talk about them when the, um, when the robots are going to serve the, the elderly, right? All those kind of people. Then you obviously will have lots of uh, situation which is you is basically unforeseen. At least, the, at least the, let's say the room has nothing changed, but the person will change. Right, the person will change, his habits will change, the furniture will be moved, and all those kind of stuff. And then he also talk about different things. There's no way you can build the robots which can cover everything. There's no way. So somehow you have to get the robots to learn by itself in a self-supervised way. But in that case, you cannot just say the robot. I mean, if you think about that as a human being as well, you can't just learn by yourself completely. So you have to. You have to interact with the per, with, with people, because the knowledge is a shared thing. If if when we talk about stuff, and uh, if we mutually do not agree, then we can't talk talk about things. We don't understand each other. Although let's say you can recognize certain things, but I call that mouse, but you don't know what the name is, so we can't we can't communicate. So we, somehow whatever we do, we have to communicate. We have to interact yeah. with with people. And obviously, with the environment as well, because you you see the, the furniture has moved. You know the the TV is no longer there. The guy is uh, is not doing the usual thing anymore. So you you have to somehow detect those things and learn those things gradually. Yeah. Thanks. So um, sometimes we cannot get the uh, results that the robot know uh, it, it's wrong. Sometimes, uh, for, for example. Uh, he didn't know he makes some mistakes, but uh, yeah. but uh, a, a, as you said, uh, we need to detect the novel instances. So the, I, see, I think this is a critical um, technologies uh, such as out of distribution detection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, 
So, I mean, uh, obviously the robot make mistakes, right? Sometimes, and uh, we probably make lots of mistakes. So uh, again, when you are in an interactive environment, somebody will point out you probably made a mistake, right? For example, you, you when you when you say certain things and you say something wrong, the, the person can just point out that no, what you said is not right. If you say that's uh, that's uh, that's a deer, oh no, no no no, that's not a deer, that's a pig, for example, all right? Then you learn, right? So we we human beings make lots of mistakes in our life too. I mean, it's just over time we we learn and it gets better. It's not that we don't have a supervision. We do have some kind of supervision in the process. It just our supervision is kind of online, you know, all the time. We 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 are not really getting ten thousand data points. Then we learn. That's it. Done. Then we go use it. Uh, that's not what happens for humans. Thank you. All right. So maybe I have one last question. Uh, this is my uh, curiosity. Uh, so being, you have been working on lifelong learning for a long time now. Uh, right. And uh, how do you see these recent progress uh, in what is called continual learning with the deep, the deep learning community? So do you see these as the future of lifelong learning? Or do you think that, uh, I mean, deep learning should be embraced as well uh, for for lifelong learning, but uh, there are other ways and, and I mean, yeah, I, 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 I definitely think so. I mean, I, I don't really know the, in terms of application. For example, the continual learning now, if you just talk about um, forgetting, dealing, dealing with forgetting, catastrophic forgetting problem, yeah. I mean, I don't really see there'll be any application now because, you know, because continual learning, your accuracy is going to drop, okay? But in practice, nobody tolerate that in application. Right. Even I want to retrain the stuff, I will do yes. that. If I need to buy two more machines, I will do that. I will not let the guy to sort of drop the accuracy by 10 or over, even two percent. I don't, I don't, I yeah. don't like that. So I don't know. I don't feel that continuing learning, just dealing with kind of stroke of forgetting, is going to be practically useful in any time soon. Okay, but if you but this kind of thing is kind of in terms of the science necessary, right? You, you have to deal with that. Another another aspect is uh, I'm not really sure that's what human being is doing, because for the human, you learn something, you you want to forget, you cannot forget, right? If you want to forget something, that thing will be remembered. <laughs> you cannot forget. So I don't know whether it's the same mechanism. Okay, probably it's not the same mechanism. Uh, so it's very hard to say, you know, what is going to be the next thing. Obviously, this uh, the, the, regarding the problem itself, they are definitely there. It should be solved. But uh, whether it's going to be applicable in the practice now, or it's going to be in the future, or it's just some other mechanism, uh, that is hard to say. I don't know. <laughs> right. right. So thank you so much, Bing, for for being here. No uh, Matthias, do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, could I ask a question still? Of course. Sure. Okay. So I I'm, I'm Matthias. Um. Uh. So uh, about the, the the question of Vincenzo um, earlier on, um, I was wondering if like for the safety in cars, for example, if you you have um, uh, speech um from uh, human interactors uh, that, that's used as, as a supervision signal. And for safety, you use this from multiple cars. Then, um, so instead of doing the, the update immediately, you collect all of these together. It kind of reminds me of more the, the federated learning setting. And um, I was wondering if in your opinion, doing this federated learning is actually um, doing this continual learning, but on a more large scale um, environment. Um, yes, um, because I mean, federal learning. If you if you don't consider the privacy, right? If you don't have this encoding, you know, the privacy, it's basically continual learning, right? And then you have yeah. you have data from many, for example, in the cell phone application, you have data from each phone. You don't want to share, but you want to. You want a model to learn from everybody, 
then you can just consider that's basically a, a continual learning problem, right? Yeah. And uh, then, then this is essentially, but of course, in the federal learning, you need to worry about the privacy or this kind of situation. That's extra. Um, the, so, I, I basically, in terms of learning, I think it's it's the same thing, the same thing. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Right. So thank you so much, Bing, for, for your talk okay. and for being here. Uh, I think now we can move to the next uh, spotlight presentation uh, from uh, Fernando. Fernando, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, cool. Cool. Oh. So let's, let's try to, to stay within the 15 minutes. Uh, otherwise, we, we risk to, <laughs> to go too far uh, in the timing. So thank you so much, Fernando, for joining. And uh, the stage is yours. Okay, here we Let me, one second. Okay, can you see the, the slides? Uh, yes, uh, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So, good afternoon. My name is Fernando. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And I'm going to tell you a little about my, the main lines of research that I'm addressing in my thesis. And my work deals with how to make smart devices learn in society and continuously. So I will start with a bit of background to give you a context. So there's an increasing number of smart devices and are around us at our homes and companies. And, and when we talk about smart devices, we mean devices like smartphones and tablets, wearables, but also robots and, and more. And we use these devices for many applications in education, health, sport, leisure, Okay, so most of these devices are already interconnected or connected to the cloud and can collect huge amounts of data from the environment because they are becoming more and more sensorized. So this data is very useful for us because we can use it to train models that allow the devices to adapt and improve their behavior. So the question is, what's the best way to do this? And the truth is that different learning paradigms have emerged. Some of them are more popular than others. And the most common approach is the cloud-centric one. So this, using this approach, we collect the data in the devices. When then we move all this data to the cloud, then in the cloud, the model is trained using all the data from all the devices in using a dedicated computer. And finally, the model can be sent back to the devices or, or not. It can also remain in the cloud. So in the last decade, the deep learning has become the most popular way to do this, to, to learn these models from huge amounts of, of data in the cloud. And regarding the, the performance of these kind of models, there's no doubt about uh, their possibilities and potential. So, however, when, when it comes to distributed devices such as smartphones or robots, this can be very inefficient or even infeasible, especially when we talk about a large number of uh, devices or users. And we have to uh, face some challenges here. And the first one is scalability in terms of storage costs, communication costs, computational costs, and moreover, we have also to take into account uh, data privacy, uh, as we were talking, uh, um, uh, well, as, as being uh, you mentioned. So um, data privacy, because in recent years, governments have been implementing more and more data privacy legislations in order to protect the, con the consumer. So nowadays, it is not as simple as sending all raw data from the devices to the cloud, which is okay, but we need to know how to deal with it. And there are, even more restrictions like, like non-stationary of data and other, uh, and other properties that we will talk about later. So um, taking into account these challenges, they ha there have emerged some adaptations of the cloud-centric framework. So for example, some of them propose a global training in the cloud and a further tuning of the model at the edge in the device, or just, just the other way, uh, and a pre-training pre of the model in the device and a final training in the cloud. But however, any of these proposals still involves moving sensitive data to perform the cloud stage. So a better option can be distributed learning. And following this approach, the learning process is carried out in a distributed and parallel manner on the devices themselves. So each device performs a local learning in a synchronous way. And then normally there's a, a global integration stage in the cloud so that a final model is consensuated. 
So this sounds more scalable and appropriate for the context of devices. And moreover, it makes it easier to protect the privacy of users because there's no need to share raw data with the cloud. And very close to this civil learning, we also have federated learning, which was proposed by Google in 2016. And we don't have enough time to, to explain the details now, but um, roughly speaking, you can keep in mind that the main difference between both distributed and federated learning is that this distributed learning mainly focus on paralyzing computing power, and federated learning is more focused on data privacy and training on heterogeneous data sets, as, as being Leo said. So um, distributed learning and federated learning are much more suitable for the context of uh, devices than centralized learning. However, there are still so there are still some challenges that this is uh, that these approaches do not address or only partially address. And here is where maybe I disagree with being Leo because the most important for, for me is non-stationarity of data. And basically, the idea is that most machine learning algorithms assume that data comes from a static distribution. But in most real world situations, data distribution change over time. And to deal with this specific problem, there's another machine learning framework, which obviously is continual learning. Um, but we see it as a completely independent thing from federated or um, distributed learning. So continual learning is the only paradigm which, which forces us to deal with a higher and realistic time scale. And here, data is available only during time and can change in different ways over time. OK, so continual learning is able to deal with non-stationary data. But uh, as far as I know, it doesn't care about other issues such as data privacy, for example. So in the end, what happens is that each proposal we have mentioned so far focus on a specific challenge and neglects others. So each framework has drawbacks. So, um, our aim uh, is to develop a new machine learning framework called local learning with the aim of facing all the challenges we have mentioned so far, all at the same time. Okay, so uh, what is this local learning about? Local, uh, local learning is a continual learning process that works in a distributed manner at two different levels, locally in the devices, but also globally in the cloud. So the main actors here are the devices, not the cloud. And this is an uh, asynchronous process, not synchronous. So each of the devices creates and refines its own local model uh, of the problem. And for that, they must continuously collect the new data using their sensors. So when a local model is obtained, it is sent back to the cloud. And there, uh, a new learning stage is performed to join the distributed models from each of the devices. And thus, we obtain a global model. And this is the, uh, the global learning stage. OK, so the global model is then shared with all the devices in the framework, in the network, sorry. And uh, thus, each device can use this global model to make predictions that will be more accurate. And this process of global consensus and local adaptation is repeated over time. So not that no raw data uh, is sent to the cloud at any time, uh, at any time only models. So user privacy is preserved. OK, so I have to say that, at least for now, our work is limited to supervised and semi-supervised problems, and in particular for classification tasks. So now, we, now that we have uh, an overview, I'd like to delve a little into the details. So in this work, we have presented the general architecture that I suggested a first implementation for each of the parts, but it is a flexible architecture. So everything I'm going to explain now can be sure, for sure um, be done in some other ways using different methods for different situations. So I will start by talking about uh, the global learning stage. So all the devices train uh, their own local models. And we will see how they do mm, this later. But for now, it's enough to know that each device trains locally a model. And eventually, these models are sent to the cloud. So in the cloud, we have to join, to merge, in some way, the local knowledge of all the devices. But how? Well, this is something that federated learning also deals with. Uh, but in the case of federated learning, there's only one single model, which is a deep neural network, which is shared with uh, all the devices. So each device locally modifies the weights of the neural network. And then in the cloud, we could simply average these weights. But remember that in our proposal, each device learns its own local model independently from the others. So, and we don't want to be tied to a specific type of learner, like a neural network 
or and we want to train the, the, the most suitable learner for the task or the one we like the most we we could do the, we do we could even perform training using a different algorithm on each device for example a support vector machine on one device a random forest on another uh, whatever so our first approach is pretty simple and it is this one we send the local models to the cloud and then they are joined using a rule-based ensemble and in particular we use a product rule to obtain a single prediction but this is not scalable because if we put all the local models in the global ensemble we could have uh, thousands or millions of devices connected and some of them will learn the task better than others so the solution we propose is to select only some local models to participate in this uh, global ensemble and we propose a selection method based on a ranking which is a, which we call distributed effective voting and there's no time to go into the details but basically what we do is to estimate a score which is the gain of including a, a local model in the global ensemble and in order to calculate that, that score each local model is evaluated by other devices using their own local data and those are the, the main elements of learning at the global level and now I'm going to mm, talk a little bit about um, the how do we learn uh, each local model on each device. So a simple uh, a simple approach could be well we gather a certain amount of data in the device, we train a classifier, and finally we send uh, this classifier to the cloud. And we could stop there, but that is a very naive approach, especially because we are not facing the problem of non-stationarity. So. Mm, the thing is that most machine learning algorithms work under the assumption that data come from a static distribution, but this assumption isn't true in many real world applications. And normally the data distribution change over time. And this is what we know as concept drift. So if we train an, a model now, maybe in one month or one week or even one day, it is useless because data is continually changing. So what do we do instead? Well, we do all this and this is the the continual local learning workflow for each of the devices um, but we don't have time to explain everything now maybe later but basically each device collects data over time and all the pre-processing is carried out in the device uh, we even have a semi-supervised labeling stage when we are working a semi-supervised context and um, when we have certain amount of data we can train a first local model and send and send it to the cloud Okay, but after that, the local learning process continues. And in order to detect if a local model becomes outdated, we use a drift detection technique. Uh, there are several ways to do this and that we can classify in three main categories, error rate based methods, data distribution based methods, and multiple hypothesis test methods. But in particular, we use a distribution based method, which is an adaptation of the original uh, method proposed in this paper here. Okay. So if a drift is detected, then the local model can be updated. And there are several approaches to do this. Uh, and we have implemented and tested some of them. The simplest one is simply get rid of the old model and train a new one from scratch. But as you can imagine, this is not ideal. So a better option is to train a new model on the new data and add this new model to a local ensemble with the old ones. And you can keep a limited number of recent uh, classifiers, for example, five or whatever. And in some case, cases, for some learners, such as neural networks or some boosting methods, you can train a partial model and resume training later. OK, so um, remember, every, every time the local model is updated, it is sent to the cloud again, and the global model is updated too. So this was uh, the theory, and now I'm going to quickly show you some experimental results. So the task we are using to test our proposals is human activity recognition using the smartphones of the users. And we want to recognize activities like walking, standing, going upstairs, etc. So in particular, I'm going to show you some experimental results obtained using a data set that contains data from 10 different users performing these seven different activities with the, the smartphone placed in five different locations. So just to have a baseline, this is the best accuracy we are able to obtain applying some of the most popular classification methods like CNN or Exiboost. And as you can see here, we get around 90% accuracy in best cases. And this is the first approach we mentioned at the beginning, the cloud-centric approach. So this implies sending all the data from all the devices to the cloud. 
Uh, yeah. So now let's move to a more realistic context. Here uh, we have a local learning process. In the first plot, uh, we can see the, the accuracy over time. So each of the colored lines is the accuracy uh, um, obtained on each of the local uh, models from each device. And the thick black line is the global accuracy of the global model consensuated. So note that the, the global model outperforms all the local models. And in fact, we have a good global model practically from the beginning. Okay, um, and this is not um, so important, but just to clarify, in, in the, um, the plot in the middle show, shows at what time each device is collecting data and at what time it trains a local model. And in the bottom, we can see the amount of data stored on each device over time. So that was a very idyllic situation because all the local models performed pretty well. But one interesting thing is that if some of the users performed worse than others, it doesn't matter because in the global model stage, in the global learning stage, we perform a selection of the models that are going to participate in the global ensemble. So in this case, we have four of the, of the local learners, uh, the light blue, the yellow, the pink, and the dark blue, that perform uh, worse because we alter their local data sets, introducing noise. So you can see that the global, um, the global model still achieves the same accuracy as before. And this doesn't happen if we train a traditional cloud-centric model. In fact, these are the results using the cloud-centric approach in that case. And you can see how all the methods lower their performances. Okay, and finally, in this example, we can see a much more realistic scenario because here we don't assume that data has to follow the same static distribution over time. The distribution can change. Uh, so in this case, data distribution change four times. So four different concept reads happens. One here, two, three, and four. So uh, at the end, uh, well, uh, we, we can see how the performance of the global model is low at the beginning, but uh, because we're testing the models against the entire testing set. But at the end, the model gives a good performance. Uh, it is able to adapt to these uh, four changes, uh, learning the new concepts without forgetting the previous ones. Okay, so that was all about experimental results. And to conclude the, to conclude the presentation, we believe that we have open a promising line of research and we know that there's a list uh, uh, there is a lot of work we can do still but here i put some of our ideas for future work such as explore optimal ways to combine knowledge locally and in the cloud study effective ways to perform local feature selection or instance selection uh, the possibility of application of techniques such as amending for semi-supervised labeling and rectification or the study of the possibility of performing a local adaptation of the global model for multitask problems. And that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Fernando, for your very interesting talk, trying to put together this with the learning, continue learning, further the learning. Uh, I think we, we need more of these kind of works where we try to put things together instead of pushing just in one direction. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I think we can quickly move to the math talk and then we will i will ask you a question for nando and i think other people okay okay, okay perfect yeah okay matt are you here yes i'm here <laughs> great all right Okay, so uh, I am Matthias Lange and I'm a PhD student at um, KU Leuven. And first of all, uh, thank you for having me here because I'm really excited to uh, share more about our work on, uh, that we presented on CVPR last week. Um, it's about unsupervised model personalization and we focus on how to preserve privacy and scalability by using the concepts uh, in continual learning. Uh, so this is work together with my supervisor, uh, Tine Tetelaars, and uh, with a team of um, people uh, affiliated on Huawei and Mila. So first of all, model personalization, what is it and how can we achieve it? So we typically have a general model 
and we have a user with some local user data. Then uh, we adapt this model um, so that we have a specific uh, user model that's uh, adapted to the user's needs. Um, so how can we do this? We can do it in two ways, as uh, was also in the, the presentation of Fernando. Um, we can first, we can do it on the server, and then we have to uh, send all of our user data over to our server. And then uh, where we have a general model, the server can then uh, adapt this model to get our final um, user specific model. Now, um, here we have the high capacity server. And therefore, uh, we can use all of this compute power to um, uh, generate this model. Um, but there are some constraints because, of course, of privacy, uh, constraints like GDPR and so on, um, they don't allow us to send to raw user images. Um, and then, of course, there is the scalability because we have these thousands of users and uh, our server should be able to perform this adaptation for all of them. Um, so there is another way to do it. Um, so this doing the local adaptation. Um, so this way we have a distributed system, more like the, this distributed learning. Um, and we have no scalability issues and no privacy issues because we don't have to send any uh, raw user data to our server. But the problem here is that we have low capacity devices. This is our uh, assumption here. Um, now, another constraint we have for both of these ways of adaptation is that we presume that we don't really have a supervision signal. And um, because we don't want to ask our user for each picture that he takes, um, so to, to give a label uh, what is to be seen on this picture. Um, so this summarizes uh, the two ways, so they all uh, adaptation on the server and the, the locally adapting. Um, they all have their pros and cons. And, but we merge them in one framework uh, where we can do two times um, the adaptation. And uh, we take the best of these two worlds in our dual user adaptation framework. Um, now we have this framework, but first of all, we need some way, a benchmark um, to define how well our system is performing. So we uh, propose three novel benchmarks. And what do we have to think about is uh, two main components. So first of all, we have users that have uh, different preferences, which are called the user prior. And we split this up in a validation and evaluation set. Um, so on the validation set, we can adapt our model and using our evaluation set, we can then see if the model is actually performing better for this user. Um, and then we have, of course, our server. Um, and he has high uh, capacity, so we can use a large training set. Um, we also use concepts of the task incremental continual learning on which we have a survey on the archive. Um, and we divide these um, sequences in distinct tasks. Um, so the first benchmark here is uh, the numbers benchmark and uh, the typical MNIST example. And um, we have five tasks of two subsequent numbers. So zero and one are going to be one task, two and three, and so on and so on. Um, but then we have two users here with different prior. So the first one is uses the MNIST data. And the other one has the SVHN data. So you can see it's very different. Uh, prior here. Um, on the server, we can then use the data of both uh, data sets. But now going to a more uh, challenging setup is using the MIT indoor scene recognition data set. And here each super category um, <coughs> presents uh, a task. Um, and in our first benchmark on the MIT indoor scene recognition, um, we uh, allocate a, a category prior to each of the users. So for example, the first user prefers uh, three classes in this first task, in the second task, and so on, and so on. And each user has some different preferences um, 
of scenes that it encounters. Now, another way we can think of it is that each user has another transformation um, locally. Um, so this could be they have other cameras. Um, this one, is, for example, spatters, Gaussian blur. Um, so now that, that we have these three benchmarks, uh, we can go to um, our framework. So the first step was this adaptation on the server. Now, how do we do this server adaptation in a scalable, privacy-preserving, and unsupervised fashion? So these are quite some constraints, right? Um, so of course, we go to continual learning. Because continual learning is not just good to avoid catastrophic forgetting and non-stationary data streams, but actually, there, there are other properties that also suit the setting. So we have this local scalability, because we have this one model that propagates through learning multiple tasks. Um, but we can also use a distributed scalability. Um, and we can actually limit the resources that the whole system of the server and all these users uh, intertwined um, are, are using. And therefore, we go to um, incremental moment matching, or IMM. And how does it work? So uh, first in IMM, we learn task-specific models. And then we get some kind of importance weights uh, for each of um, these models. And then afterwards, we merge all of these models together uh, on a weighted averaging with these importance weights. And we get our single model for all of these tasks. So how does this fit in our dual user adaptation framework? Um, let's take a closer look. So um, this here, uh, we have a model for each of the tasks now. And this is a scalable solution because we don't have a model for each of the users. This could be thousands or millions. Um, so in our first step here, we collect our user prior. And in our case, um, this user prior will be our importance weights. And using this importance weights for our user and our local models here, we can then aggregate all of them into a single personalized model. Now, another benefit of this is that we also retain the privacy. So uh, we send this user prior, but the, we don't send any raw user images, but rather this implicit user prior, which is these importance weights. But how do we cope with um, the fact that we don't have any labels on our local data? Um, because uh, mode IMM actually uh, relies on the Fisher information matrix, which is loss-based, therefore requires labels. And therefore, uh, we investigate whether uh, other kinds of importance weights can be used, such as uh, the mass importance weights, because they are based on the output function, and therefore we don't need any kind of supervision. And um, in our setup here, we have our three benchmarks. You can see that we have quite similar results, and therefore we can use this mass importance weights instead. Okay, so to summarize, um, we have our DUA, uh, dual user adaptation framework, and we have our specific implementation here, which we call Remote Adaptive Continual Learning, or RACL. Um, so, as a, to recall, we have a scalable um, system because we have now a model for each task instead for each of the users. Um, we preserve our privacy because we use importance weights, but now because we use a mass importance weights, uh, we also uh, don't need any uh, local labeled data. Okay, so now of course you want to know how our system is performing, and of course we were expecting huge increases in performance. Um, so in the results here, our ACL is our personalized model for our users, and IMM is just giving a, a general model trained on just on the training data on the server. Then we have the mass importance weights that we use, which are unsupervised, and the Fisher information matrix, um, which is based on uh, loss. So looking at our results, um, we see that we get some consistent improvements with our RACL implementation. Uh, but we can see also that these um, increase that we get is uh, quite insignificant. And we are quite astonished by this. Um, and 
So we further investigated why this is actually the case. Um, therefore, we looked at the importance weights and we found some uh, consistencies in our analysis. Um, so looking at figure A and B, um, we have M1, which is our model trained on our first task, and M2, model trained on the second task. Uh, or this could be any pair of tasks here because uh, we had some consistent observations here. Now, D1 and D2 are our data sets for these tasks. Um, and what we investigate now is how do the importance weights correlate uh, between uh, these two tasks. So um, going with our uh, first task data and from our second, second task, and we estimate it on the same model that we have a very high correlation. Um, and the same when we uh, estimate it on our second task and uh, we compare the two uh, importance weights, we have a very high correlation here. Now, this is not what we want because uh, we want low correlation and this indicates that uh, the importance weights are rather depending on the model rather than our data we estimated from. Uh, so and whether we do it with, with D1 or D2, we actually get quite some similar importance weights. So additional experiments we did was then uh, looking at our first model and our second model, uh, but then we use the same data. And here we see that we have way lower correlation, um, which means that uh, our, the importance weights are more relying on the model it is estimated from. So, okay, uh, summarizing all of this, um, importance weights are indicating that parameter importance is actually more relying on the specific model rather than the data we estimated it from. And this is, of course, not what we want because we want to adapt to our local user data. And uh, this is inhibiting uh, this practice. Okay, so in our first phase, we had our adaptation on the server. But of course, we can still uh, adapt locally. Uh, and this is our second phase. So this is still our first phase. We have here our personalized model that we can send to our user. And sending this to a user, he can do another round of uh, local adaptation. Um, and this allows our framework um, to not only be scalable, privacy preserving, and unsupervised, but now also uh, allows two times this user personalization. Um, how can we see this problem now in this um, second round of adaptation is actually uh, domain adaptation because we go from this huge training data from our server and we actually want to go to our user uh, specific domain. Um, so there we relied on some um, methods from uh, domain adaptation and um, yeah, recall that our user is actually limited in its resources. So uh, we assume that it cannot just train models on loads of data. Um, but instead, we assume that, for example, we can just adapt the batch normalization statistics in proposed AWN. And uh, this allows an unsupervised way for adaptation. And for our two uh, benchmarks here on MIT's inverse scene recognition. So with the categories as prior and our transformations as a prior, uh, we can get some improvements, but they are not quite consistent and we don't get a lot of improvements as well. Um, so another thing that we thought of is what if we relax um, the fact that we want this unsupervised adaptation and that we have some data over the user that's actually labeled. Um, then we could actually also train the batch normalization parameters, such as the scaling factor and um, the shifting parameter. And doing this, we get consistent improvements of over 3%. Um, so this also indicates we still have this open problem for a lightweight and unsupervised domain adaptation, which is quite challenging. Okay, so now we can conclude all of this. Um, I uh, proposed our dual user adaptation framework. It's scalable as we have models in the amount of tasks rather than amount of users, privacy preserving, 
and uh, unsupervised because we use this important ways at the user prior. We do the server adaptation here in this first phase, and then we do a second round of adaptation, which is done locally. And here we don't have the issues of uh, privacy um, and it's also uh, preserved scalability. Um, in our study, we also found these open problems. So in our first phase, yeah, we actually want our importance weights to be rather data dependent rather than relying on the model it is estimated from. And then of course, we also, in our second round here, we want a better domain adaptation, which is preferably unsupervised, but must also be in uh, a lightweight fashion. Um, so the code is available online for the benchmarks um, and all of the experiments. Uh, this QR codes go to the paper, it's an archive as well. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me, um, but I will also be available in the discussion. Thank you, Matt, for your great presentation. Uh, I think now uh, we can start uh, with a few questions, the speakers. So does anyone has a question uh, that wants to work with Matt or uh, Fernando or Roger? I had a question actually for uh, Fernando. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, for me, it wasn't really clear how, um, so there are, there are quite some resemblances in, in, in these frameworks that we presented. Um, yeah. So I was wondering how, how uh, the, the global stage works in, in, in your framework. Yeah, because you have this distributed learning, so I, if I understood correctly, each user also has a personalized model, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but then this personalized model is sent to the server, and um, there is like a global model. Okay, I, I understand. Um, I, I think I understand. Yeah, it's not like a personalized model because, okay, maybe in the future we address the the, the issue about personalization, but for yeah. now we assume, we assume the task is unique for all the the learners, right? So. Okay, the, the local model is personalized in the sense that it has a bias uh, because th there's a bias in the data set of, the, of the, each of the users. So each of the users has a different training set. Um, so at the end, uh, this diversity, uh, well, we, we, we want to, to, to join in some way this, all these biases from all these users to share an ensemble, that's all. And we, we want to, we assume the global model is going to make better predictions uh, than, than, than each of the local uh, participants. Okay, so, so the main goal is then to have a better like global model, right? That's following the trends of all the users? Yeah, yeah. In the future, uh, for future work, we uh, want to, uh, well, to work uh, in, as I said, multitask problems where uh, what maybe there can be a specific or a, um, some kind of adaptation of the global model to each of the particularities of each uh, participant. You know? yeah. uh, but, but how does it uh, differ then from federated learning? Because federated learning, you get these gradients from all these local users, and you also get this trend following models from, from all of these. Okay, users. yeah, in, in that sense, it's pretty, pretty close to federated learning. The thing is, federated learning, uh, Okay, first of all, uh, we are not tied to a specific type of learner because uh, the thing of using an ensemble is because uh, you can put in the ensemble whatever you, you want to, to, to introduce. So um, that's the first difference. Mm -hmm. um, talking about the, the global learning, and there's another difference in the global learning stage, which is the what well, the the distribution, the distributed voting of the of the, the of the, model, of the models. So, uh, in the global ensemble, uh, we don't we don't join all the all the knowledge from every device. We we have a selection, right? Uh, so that we ensure that mm, only well mm, the, the task the, the task is is learned correctly. I don't know. If, 
um, if I, if it, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think in federated learning, they also make like a sub-selection of users. Um, but I think it's a random selection maybe. But, but then here it's more, more like, uh, the selection is more more confined or yes it's, it's yeah. like that uh, uh well um and and, and what well, the, the the main difference uh between federated and, and and local learning is the continual part because uh in federated learning okay you um, at the end you assume that data comes from a static distribution maybe there are biases between different users but you assume that because you have a lot of users at the end uh, you are uh, you are learning the task and the, the task is uh, the, 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 under, the underlying distribution of the of the the data sets is, is static but this assumption is it's not true in, in, in reality I don't know if if you understand. So uh, you have to to have some kind of uh, well, like as a drift uh, detection technique to detect when uh, you should uh, uh, yeah. um, you should uh, update your model. And in, in fact, in federated learning, you are training uh, all the time. Okay, maybe not the same device, but you are training uh, uh, continually. Uh, you continually acquire new data and you use it to train and maybe you are wasting uh, computing uh, computational resources and uh, with no need i don't know if so yeah. It's, yeah, it's training with when it is necessary not training because you can train okay okay um but, but then how do you avoid catastrophic forgetting your global model right because you yeah, detect this drifts and then update your global model yeah, and at some point you have to forget something. For example, uh, it, it also depends that uh, um, in the technique you use to retrain to to retain uh, the, the past uh, past concepts. But at, at, suppose that at some point you have to forget something. So uh, what to forget and what to um, don't forget is given um, from the devices because at the end uh, who who, who rate each of the models that participate in the in the global ensemble are the devices themselves or so the users. So depending on the concepts that the users are uh, viewing the most, I don't know if I explain. Depending on what the, the users or the devices do, uh, the concepts will remain in the global uh, ensemble or not, or will disappear. Okay. Thank you. I'll leave some room for others to ask some questions. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have a question for, for Fernando. So in your technique, essentially you keep an ensemble of models globally and then use that ensemble to, if I understood correctly, uh, to also be used in, 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 the, in the client side and the users. Uh, and uh, But in this exam, uh, ensemble, you want to keep your, this diversity in terms of algorithms that you use uh, you mentioned SVM or neural networks etc mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking uh, if you for example stick to neural networks uh, there are a lot of techniques uh, uh, in which you can somehow merge these models together like with a distillation yeah. process or something and that would reduce uh, massively your <clears throat> your yes. memory and, and energy yeah. control uh, have you thought that this do you think that Adding uh, a lot of different algorithms is uh, something that is really needed, or do you think you could stick with one learning algorithm, maybe neural networks, and uh, and use these uh, uh, as an advantage to reduce even more the computational and, and memory overheads? Yeah, I, I agree uh, with you. So, in fact, uh, what I said in the in the presentation was that what I present was uh, uh, the first uh, proposal. So we we suggest a first implementation for each of the of the parts, but this is flexible. So depending on the situation, uh, maybe we can use different methods. In, in the case of the uh, of the global uh, consensus, in, in this case we presented a, an ensemble. But if you you work in deep learning scenario or 
Mo yeah. More related with federated learning in this case. Imagine you have a CNN trained in each device. I don't know if it makes sense in smartphones, but imagine you, got, you have a CNN trained uh, from each device. Well, in that case, it makes more sense to simply average the weights of, of, of the net of the network that uh, an ensemble. But it, I, uh, be enough. I mean, yes. I oh, know. Sorry, uh, I think I lost the connection for a bit. Uh, do you think that averaging, averaging just these models would be enough, so even though they are being trained for a very long, long time, maybe uh, on the edge on different devices on different data? Um, okay. One thing is how do you merge the, the knowledge from yeah. these devices? But the other thing, which is for us independently, is um, uh, which which information you pick from each of the of the devices or, or which devices you you choose and for that we have the other uh, the other um, module which is the the one who selects the one that selects uh, the the local learners that participate in the in the model in the global model so you can simply uh, okay you can simply average the the weights like in federated learning but selecting which uh, from which devices you 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 perform the, the average process. Okay, thanks. And do we have uh, other questions for our speakers? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, I lost the connection <laughs> for a few seconds. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Matthias. Uh, yeah. If I if I um, understood well in your uh, in your model, uh, you have to take in the server um, some some example of all the data distribution that uh, uh, your device has experienced. I'm right. So you have to. Uh, oh. So uh, have you thought about a situation in which uh, um, a device uh, uh, I don't know acquire or have to deal with. Uh, uh, some data that uh, is not in the server, so it, uh, it, it counts for a completely different distribution. Uh, can you think about that? Or uh... yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, problem as well. And uh, for now, we assume the uh, server to have enough tasks to capture uh, okay. the, the distribution of the user. Um, but indeed, it would be very interesting if we could also. Maybe even using also these, these importance weights, uh, looking if um, we have this out of uh, distribution samples. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I just uh, just a question about uh, if you have thought about this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you. Your your mic is off. <laughs> Sorry, I was speaking <laughs> for a long time, but yeah, I was saying <laughs> if there are if there are not any more questions, I think uh, we can close this meetup. Uh, I think it's been a couple of hours that so you're talking about <laughs> continue learning now, and so thank you all for joining, and thank you for the speakers so took the time to to give a talk here today and. Uh, uh, I asked them if they want to share the slides so they can send it to me and they will upload them on a topic I'm going to create. On uh, this uh, meeting recording for you to see it on YouTube uh, soon enough. So thank you all again for joining and I'll see you uh, in the next uh, continuing AI meetup or in the reading group session we're going to have uh, next week. So thank you again and see you. And thank you for organizing. Okay, bye bye. See you. Bye. Thank you.